In the Garden is a Christian classic. Do you want me to recite it or sing it to you? I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear Falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tell we there none other has ever known I already Sorry, I already spent my voice last night in the Tagalog service and early this morning in the last night in the Saturday service and this morning in the early service. So I pardon, pardon me for that poor performance. <laughs> Today I'll talk to you about the tale of two cities. I should say the tale of two gardens. The tale of two gardens. Eden and Gethsemane, gardens that are fertile with spiritual insights regarding temptation, defeat by temptation, and victory over temptation. Let's turn to Genesis 2, 8 to 17. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, from where it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. It's it winds through the entire land of Havila, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Kus. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the you pray this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat. That sounds good to all of us. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you it of it, you will surely die. Your outline in the bulletin shows three points all alliterated delight, disobedience, and death. We'll begin with delight. In Hebrew, uh, the word Eden means pleasure or delight. What made the garden delightful, as you already heard me read it to you, was God's exotic landscaping, beautiful trees that were also good for food, colorful decorations with gold, resin, and onyx, and a river from Eden that separated into four rivers that watered the garden. But, but, more than God's exotic landscaping, God's presence himself was the delight that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the garden. Point, nothing can delight our hearts like God's presence in us and with us. 
regardless of the beautiful surrounding you might be enjoying at home or wherever it is, I submit to you that nothing can delight our hearts better than God's presence with us and in us. My wife planted a beautiful garden in our backyard. She's a good gardener. She does the gardening, although we have a gardener. She enjoys it. With decorative trees, fruit trees, flowering plants, different vegetables, and a swimming pool in the middle. She spends a lot of energy, time, and money enjoying the garden. Okay? Uh, when we moved to the house about, how many years ago? Four or five? You could count the number of plants there with your two hands. Now you have to use a computer to count them, to record them, and classify them. That's how, how the garden uh, expanded and uh, improved. So, I repeat my tagline here. Delight, delight in the garden, whatever that garden is. Could be your home. Delight in the garden is really, really delightful when God is with you in the garden. Amen? When God is with you in the garden. The real delight in our garden is God's presence with us. When my wife and I pray together in the garden with our little dog, Joy, who seems to worship God with us. <laughs> okay. People ask, what do you do on your, be- uh, on your uh, day off, Pastor Fred? I don't go uh, much uh, uh, away from the house. Uh, I tend to just stay there in the garden, enjoy my wife's presence and uh, the presence of God with us. But sadly... Disobedience to God destroyed Adam and Eve's delight in the garden when they fell into temptation. So we now move to Genesis 3, 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? Very subtle. He planted a doubt in their minds by asking, did God really say? He didn't say God did not say. He said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden, which was not true, because they were free to eat except from one. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, And you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die. You will not surely die, Satan said. God knows. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Question. As a good husband, why did Adam not stop Eve from eating? To make it even worse, why did he join her in eating? I think that was a leadership crisis on the part of the husband, Eve. Right? She was there. She was listening to the conversation between Satan and his wife. And the wife finally gave in to the temptation and took up the tree and then gave it to him. And he consented. What do you call that? Leaders of failure, instead of doing his job as a husband, instead of prohibiting the wife from doing something wrong, he joined her. So, look at this. The devil did not tempt Adam and Eve to doubt the existence of God because the devil is not an atheist. Tell me, the devil is not an atheist. 
In fact, James 2, 19 tells us that demons and the devil tremble in the knowledge that God exists. Actually, uh, the devil is wiser than a lot of so-called bright people in America today who are atheists. I'm not knocking you, but I'm just informing you that the devil knows better than you. Okay? Now, note the temptation strategy of Satan that defeated Adam and Eve. Note the temptation strategy of Satan that defeated Adam and Eve. First, the devil tempted Adam and Eve to distrust the goodness of God. To distrust the goodness of God. To undermine God's rightful authority and lordship over their lives. Why did I say that? Because Satan was implying, if God is good, why is he prohibiting you from eating something that's good for you? Okay? And maybe this God of yours is not really looking after your own welfare or pleasure or joy. He's just protecting himself. He doesn't want you to be like him totally because you might become independent of him and just walk away from him. Secondly, the devil tempted Adam and Eve to be dissatisfied with their blessings in the garden. Because Satan convinced them that they should have more for their total satisfaction. They already had plenty. They were surrounded with bountiful and beautiful blessings. But Satan convinced them that's not enough. You need more than what you have now. That's a temptation. That's an American uh, advertising uh, piece. More, better, bigger. So Satan will create an artificial need in your life and in my life to tempt you. Okay? Thirdly, the devil tempted Adam and Eve to become independent from God by saying, when you eat of this, you'll be like God. If you go back to Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, we already know that God created man in his image and likeness. So why did Satan say, you know what? God is prohibiting you from eating of this tree because he doesn't want you to become like him. In what sense? To the point that you become independent of him. If you're totally like him, you won't need him anymore. So you can declare psychological independence from this God. Just eat. Okay? Fourthly, the devil tempted Adam and Eve to disregard their fear of God by saying, You will not surely die. When you disobey God. You know what, friends? When we lose the fear of God, we'll do anything against God. When we lose the fear of God, we'll fall into sin. That's why the book of Proverbs, over and over, the book of Psalms, over and over, repeat the need for a healthy reverence or fear of God. Amen? So, uh, Jim Baker, some of you remember, those of you who are as old as I am, uh, used to be a powerful, powerful radio uh, evangelist. Uh, after Jim Baker's downfall that collapsed his gigantic ministry 30 plus years ago, he wrote a book regarding his moral failure summarized in one sentence. He said, I did not lose the love of God. I just lost the fear of God. I did not lose the love of God. I just lost the fear of God, which led to my moral failure. There is an overemphasis today in uh, a lot of churches, in a lot of ministries, uh, overemphasizing the love of God to the neglect of the fear of God. You see what's happening in America, in American churches? Love, 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 love. There's no fear. Okay? There's no fear. Uh, so we need to keep this in mind that when we lose the fear of God, we'll go into all kinds of directions against God. Amen? Now, what happened as a result? Death was the result. Death in the garden was the effect of Adam and Eve's disobedience. Again, let's look at Genesis 3, 17, 19, 23. To Adam, God said, Because you listened to your wife, because you listen to your wife. Don't be offended, you wives. 
Okay? Because you listened to your wife and, and, and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Question. When do you and I need to stop listening to our wives? <laughs> I listen to my wife. One of the wisest women in the world. I can assure you that. Very wise. Right? So, the answer to my question is, to have a good relationship with your wife, you listen to them as much as possible. As much as possible. The only time you stop listening to them is when they tell you to do something wrong. That's the answer to that. Right? Amen? So, God was, God was watching what happened, and uh, he diagnosed the problem of Adam. He said, because you listened to your wife to do something wrong. Up to this point, so far, so good. So, 19, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are and dust, and to dust he will return. So the Lord banished him, threw him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Let's do some reflections. Men was not created a robot, say robot. But man was created as a free moral agent responsible to God for his choices and actions, just like you and I. Amen? On your outline, the second point is, man's autonomy or freedom for self-governance is not absolute. There is no absolute freedom here, friends, for all of us creatures. Only God has absolute freedom. So, Man's autonomy or freedom for self-governance is not absolute but limited. Case in point, Adam and Eve died when they chose to disobey God and they brought death to the whole human race. Romans 5.12, Paul summarizes the story by saying, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Like Adam and Eve, we are free to choose, but we are not free from the consequence or consequences of our choice or choices. We are free to choose, but we are not free from the consequence of our choice. Amen? Okay. Case in point again. When Adam and Eve chose to elect Satan's propaganda against God, they lost everything. They lost their connection to God. They lost their garden home. And finally, they lost their lives. Indeed, election has consequences. I'm not talking about the political election. I'm talking about something else here. Election has consequences. Electing Satan instead of God will eventually destroy us. Electing Satan instead of God will eventually destroy us. So let's move on to the next garden. Okay? From Adam's defeat by Satan in the Garden of Eden, now to Christ's victory over Satan in the Garden of Gethsemane. Eden is Hebrew, Gethsemane is Greek. The meaning of the word Gethsemane is olive press. Olive press where olives are pressed to produce olive oil. This is a picture of Jesus who was pressed by the burden of sin he carried on himself that excreted blood from his skin, the other evangelist tells us. He was so overwhelmed carrying the load of sin on his back in the garden that literally blood oozed out of his skin. Let's look at the story. Matthew 26, 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane 
And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, the inner circle among the 11 remaining disciples, Judas gone. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Why would God be troubled? Why would God be sorrowful? This is the human Jesus. The human Jesus. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul, again the human Jesus had a soul. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Question. Why did Jesus repeat himself three times? Did he not prohibit repetitious prayer in Matthew chapter 6? How come he is repeating himself here? He has repeated himself here three times. Let me give you some time to uh, process that and ponder that in your mind and heart. The reason for that, I believe, is this. In his humanity, he was struggling. And uh, he wanted to be sure that he would not fail to do the will of God for him. In other words, you may repeat your prayer unless you are like a pagan just parroting your prayer to God without thinking about them. But when something is heavy on your heart, you may say it over and over and over until it is settled in your mind. Amen? Okay. That's why he repeated himself three times just to be sure he doesn't miss anything. Now, I outlined this uh, reading by uh, three alliterated words also, supplication, submission, and salvation. Okay? Let's look at Jesus' supplication. We just read them. I'm not going to repeat them. Jesus, knowing that he would, be, he would carry the sin of the world upon himself, and he would become sin. For us on the cross, Jesus, knowing that he would be forsaken by God on the cross, Jesus, knowing the brutal torture he would undergo on the cross, Jesus' humanity was overwhelmed. Jesus' humanity was overwhelmed. Jesus' humanity was overwhelmed by the coming suffering on the cross. And he asked the Father if there was another way to redeem sinners other than his sacrificial death on the cross for them. But the father was mute. The father was silent. No comment. No answer from the father. This is so important for us to get. Although the father was silent, although the father didn't answer Jesus, Jesus was not discouraged from going on and doing his job to go to the cross. Sometimes we go through this, you and I know this. 
When you pray and pray and pray and pray, you fast and pray. And it looks like God is not minding your prayers. Nothing is happening. Nothing is changing. It's all the same. And then you get discouraged. You either stop praying, and then you just quit doing what you are supposed to do. Am I the only one? So, learn from Jesus. When you ask God for something, and God in his sovereign wisdom knows you should not get that something, don't just walk away from God. Keep on following God. To begin with, Jesus already knew the answer to that. Why would the Father tell him the reason when back in eternity they agreed the Son would come down and die on the cross? But as I said, when he became a man in his humanity, he recoiled at the idea of him becoming sin and suffering on the cross for us. So, the Father's silence did not discourage Jesus from doing the will of God. Do you know, friends, one of the most painful things to endure is silence. If your wife gives you a silent treatment or your husband gives you a silent treatment, you'll die. How many of you can survive one week your wife doesn't talk to you? Or one month your husband <laughs> doesn't talk to you? It's very cruel. Instead of yelling at you, they'll just shut up and they don't want to talk to you. They'll look at you. No communication, period. Wow. But Jesus, we learn from this, Jesus. Although the Father gave him a silent treatment, he did not get discouraged. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, because of Jesus' supplication, Jesus' submission to the Father's will made him embrace the suffering on the cross. From supplication, he moved to submission, and then he finally embraced the cross. So, Jesus' submission to the will of the Father resulted in his salvation victory in our behalf. Salvific or salvation victory in our behalf. Again, let's do some reflections. Like Jesus, prayer should be our first preparation before facing any crucial challenges in our lives. Prayer should be our first preparation before facing any foreseeable crucial coming up along the way to challenges. I don't need to detail this. Um, you know, I don't know your situation, uh, but we're all human. And uh, the difference between us and animals, animals don't worry. Have you seen a dog worrying? <laughs> Have you seen a cat worrying? You know why they don't worry? They don't remember the past. And they don't know the future. Do you know why you worry? You remember what you did yesterday? And you remember what could happen to you tomorrow. Okay? So, <laughs> when you're about to uh, face a humongous challenge that will almost kill you, what's the best preparation for you to do? Google all the information around there and check all the information floating around there. Read all the books about what you're going to go through. Talk to all the people you know and get their wisdom and so forth. Those are all good. I submit to you, the first preparation you and I need to take when you know that you're going to face a humongous challenge in your life is prayer. So say, for example, the diagnosis says you'll be going through a, a critical surgery uh, in, a, in a few weeks. Cancer, tumor, whatever. That's a critical uh, challenge you'll be facing. What should be your first preparation? Prayer. Some of you have done that. I know some of you. That's why you are not rattled. You are composed and serene to face those challenges because you were prayed up. Amen? Amen. Second reflection. Like Jesus, our submission to our Heavenly Father, to His will, will be our main weapon for victory. Our submission to the Father's will will be our main weapon for victory. Famous Billy Graham tells us, only in the Christian life, submission becomes, submission becomes a victory. 
You know, friends, all of us wants to be winners and wants to be, uh, all of us want to be winners and all of us want to be victorious. Let me just shoot straight here. If you and I are not willing to do the will of God for us, there is no point of talking about victory and winning. You and I can never win if we put aside the will of God for our lives. But if we say like Jesus, not my will but thine, that is the weapon for victory for all of us. Amen? Hallelujah. Like Jesus, the submission of our will to the Father's will will enable us to do His will no matter the suffering involved in the obedience. Is it easy to live for God? There are many, many challenges, especially if you are serving God in a full-time ministry. It's very difficult. But when we submit our will to God, that submission will enable us to do the will of God no matter the suffering involved in the obedience. Satan will tempt us to disobey God all the days of our life. Do, do you think Satan stopped tempting Jesus after the 40 day fasting and prayer? No, 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 no. Satan kept on tempting Jesus up to the cross. So, uh, brace up yourselves as uh, believers. Satan will tempt us to disobey God all the days of your life, our lives. Secondly, Satan will tempt us to distrust God's goodness and to question the restrictions he puts around our lives. What was the restriction? Don't eat up that tree in the middle. Okay, if you expand that restriction, Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are ten prohibitions. Did you know that? When God surrounds us with prohibitions, we question God. Why am I so restricted? I cannot move much. I mean, wherever I go, there is a, I mean, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. So, uh, what's the point? Do not distrust God's goodness. Do not question his restrictions he puts around your life for your own safety. Sometimes you are accused of being legalistic. Legalistic. That's legalism. I don't care what you call it. If God puts a restriction around your life and around my life, don't question God's restriction because he knows better than you. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Thirdly, Satan will tempt us to become discontented with God. Discontented with God. To disregard God's will. To get what we want, regardless of what God says. It's very, very dangerous to get discontented with God. Because when you and I get discontented with God, nothing will make you content. Nothing. Nothing. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Fourthly, Satan will tempt us to risk our spiritual life by indulging in personal pleasures forbidden by God. Right? Lastly, Satan will tempt us to turn our delight in God to self-destruction by disobeying God. Actually, that's the punch line of all of this teaching this morning. Satan will tempt us to turn our delight in God to our self-destruction by disobeying God. So let's transition from Adam to Jesus. Um, look at Jesus' pattern for overcoming temptation. Jesus' pattern for overcoming temptation. Number one, prayer. I already said that, prayer. Our primary preparation to face any temptation in life is prayer. I'm repeating myself because I'm emphasizing this. Secondly, purpose. What really matters in our life should be doing the will of God if we want to overcome temptation. That's purpose. Thirdly, priority. Doing the will of the Father must be our top priority. When we don't prioritize the will of God, we will easily fall into any temptation. And 
Number four, people. Say people. People. When you and I are being tempted, especially we are in the ministry or leadership position, think of the people who will benefit from your victory over your temptation. On the other hand, when you and I are being tempted, think of the people whose lives will be damaged if you and I fail. This is a huge point in ministry. This is a huge point for parents. If your father or your mother fail, look at what will happen to your kids. They'll fail too, most likely. So uh, the, 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 the fourth principle here is people. You must be people-oriented. The ministry is about people. It's about buildings, about people. So you and I, all of us, members and pastors alike, go through temptations all the time. So when you are tempted, think of the people, I repeat myself, who will benefit from your victory. And at the same time, think of the people who will be damaged by your by, by, by defeat. Amen? Okay. Lastly, power. Power. Submission to the will of God will empower us to defeat temptation and become winners with Christ. Shall we stand, please?